Welcome to the Fashion and Color Show, where we have dynamic conversations with designers and creatives influencing fashion. This show was inspired by our book, Fashion and Color, Volume 1, that serves to preserve the history of black designers A to Z. Let's get into the show. And we are here today with Sean Peen, the That's founder me. and creative director of June 79, a brand that is dressing, I mean, some of our favorite celebrities, some of our favorite NBA player. I mean, you're now becoming a staple in the NBA tunnel. We're just going to claim that, we right? Are. We are. And, um, and I'm so excited. Like, I've gotten a chance to work with you a couple yeah. times yeah. Uh, we were able to show your collection in 2021 which that's was right. major for us that was our first show wow that was, was our it? first show yeah that was wow, our first show so, so dope how yeah. you doing i'm good i'm great and you know i'm here i'm excited <laughs> to be here i'm happy to be here good. and so yeah things are good things i love are good. it no complaints. I love it. and you're wearing june 79 i mean there's of nothing course. else of course <laughs> it's all i could wear you know i, I gotta rep the brand i love it yeah. you know um my husband, people don't know this, but he's a he's like an undercover fashion guy with his like Balenciaga sneakers yeah, yeah, and his, yeah. you know, he, he's doing all the things. Yeah. And June 79 is one of his favorite brands. He absolutely loves the brand, loves the fit. Yeah. And so um He looks good yeah, in it. He, I've seen him in it. He, he looks look good, good in it. He feels good in it. Yeah. So look, so we try not to break the bank though. Okay, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> My goal is to break the bank. No, honestly, try not to break the bank. But no, it's 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 an investment piece, and it's one of those things that, like, you know, he can have it. He can wear the jacket with another yeah. pair of jeans. Yeah. He can wear the pants with another shirt. So we love it. No, I'm glad to hear that. And you know, one of the things that people do say when they wear our product is that it gives them a different sense of confidence. Like they're just, it's it's something about the product that people just love to wear because they. Just, there's a certain level of confidence that they have wearing June 79, which is my favorite thing to hear about people wearing it. So no, it's, it's love dope. That. I was with the um, guys from Earn Your Leisure, mm. and I said to Troy and Rashad, you need to check out June 79. All right, now. Let's it's go. the brand to check out. So I want to get into your journey because um, you've had this incredible, I think, journey in fashion that's actually very unique to a lot of designers because you didn't start out in design. I did not. So, did not. but I'm going to take it way back. Let's go back to like where you grew up, what you thought you would be and how you got into fashion. So I grew up in Brooklyn. So I'm right. a Brooklyn native, Brooklyn, Brooklyn native born and raised, house. right? All, like, <laughs> all day. And so I, um, you know, coming out of high school, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I think... For me, coming out of Brooklyn, you don't see a lot of um, people in fashion or certain industries. And I think, you know, growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, it's like if you didn't play ball, rap, or just like hung out, you weren't like anything else would be, you know, made fun of. And so I think it took me a, a little bit, but um, I thought I was going to go into criminal justice, funny enough. And that was one of the first things. I had a teacher who um, took an interest in just helping me kind of like figure out what was next and so i started off that way but when i got to college university of maryland what i realized was there was so much more out in the world and so i was i was just very curious about what was next um and then ultimately fell into fashion and really fell in love with it i like to dress up what was and your first job in fashion my first job in fashion was working in a store i was actually working um i had took an, an internship at jc penny um, and so, uh, that was big because I thought I was going to go into radio. I was actually working at a radio station. Wow. And so that was my, and then I kind of took this. I can see that. You got a radio voice. Do I? Yeah. All right. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to do that. And then, um, but I really fell in love with fashion. So my first job in fashion was working for JC Penney. Um, I in was the store. in the store and I had taken a job as an intern department manager. Um, and so. Uh, on day two, they gave me the keys to the store, and I was just. And then the manager was leaving in a week because she was on maternity leave. So it was just me and like four women over sixty-five that were like managing the men's department. And so that was my first like really intro, being on the floor, making sure the floor was set every morning, um, setting schedules, doing that whole um, uh, in-store activities. And then the manager 
um, at the time, this guy, Dave Millard was, was, um, I can't believe I still remember his name, <laughs> but he was, you know, um, he took to me in terms of like my work ethic and said, you should really try the buying program and it's in Dallas and that's where they are. It's a great training program. It teaches you everything you want to know about fashion. And so I applied and I got in and, um, the next summer I was in Dallas wow. working for JC Penney. It was 30 kids. Uh, from different from various schools and they were only going to select 12 So this summer actually was like an early version of the apprentice. It was probably one of the most funniest things um, Everyone had projects presentations. Some people were like stealing ideas. It was like it was a oh, it was a reality show Wow, but um, in doing so it really taught me a lot. I got to see sourcing. I got to see marketing buying um, planning you know all parts of the business and really ultimately fell in love with buying because I got to be involved with the product and early advice that I got was you always want to be on um, a part of the business that makes money for the company so whenever times get tough they're not just laying you know you off it's always the support functions that and so I was like hmm good idea and so buying was part of that but also there was this creativity within buying because you got to select the products you got to be involved in in, in the product and really had a say in what would come into the stores and so gravitated towards that and um, I was selected I was one of the 12 I was offered um, a job and from there I um, I found myself moving to Dallas so I lived there for wow. a couple years this was in the uh, early 2000s and so did that for a couple years I was in men's tailored clothing it was my first role and um, so yeah that was my first job that. which led to that and then led to so much more but so how did you go from there because you were at Balmain for a while, mm -hmm. right? Like what was that journey like? It's a long journey. That's us a long it. journey. Yeah, so from JCPenney, I was I was recruited by Macy's. And so I, um, for me, I thought to myself, if, I, if I'm going to be in fashion, where do you have to be? It was in New York. So I wanted to come back to New York. Um, and so I moved back to New York, took a job with Macy's, and I was... There for a couple of years, I was in men's, I was in women's, I was buying women's classic sportswear, which gave me a completely different perspective of the business because I'd never actually had a women's role before. And so that was um, that was fun. It was new. It was challenging. It was different. And then after a couple of years there, I went to Saks and I was at Saks. Um, I was recruited by Saks by a great merchant who I still respect to this day. His name was Tom Ott and, um, and who's now become a dear friend and also a mentor. But uh joined Saks and he um i became the men's footwear buyer not too soon after and that's really where i made a name for myself in this industry um at the time when i had uh got into men's shoes it was black and brown shoes so at the time i had this radical idea of going after luxury sneakers mm. and so i did this whole presentation showing sneakers with suits and um, we were in the executive room about like new big new ideas and I presented it and pretty much got laughed out of the room because wow. everyone was like this is like no nobody's is, gonna wear sneakers no one's gonna wear sneakers with suits wow. unless you're riding the Metro North wow. right and so um, ultimately kept pushing and Tom you know at the time was saying you know I don't really understand it but I believe in you I put you in this job for a reason and so we're gonna support you and so through that um, really found my voice in speaking up and saying, hey, I really believe in, in this business and it allows us to to go after and cultivate a younger customer. Mm -hmm. And so in doing so, we were able to pretty much quadruple the business in like 18 months. Wow. It was it was unreal. And so that was a big, big part of the trajectory in my career um, that kind of shifted um, from where I was to where I was going. So did that and then had another role in, in men's accessories, did the same there. I had found some tremendous success in building that business, just finding pockets of business that didn't exist before. Yeah. And so did that. Um, and then ultimately in, in uh, 2014, I was offered a role with Valentino to run their um, wholesale business for North America. So did that, took that role and that was exciting. So I was on the department store side and then I was moved to the brand side so now I'm working with all the department stores and and to me that kind of helped me see just a different perspective and a different lens of the yeah. business and so did that for a couple years managing that wholesale business which was great because Valentino was at a transition with Maria Gracia and Pierre Paolo had just uh, joined and they were moving away from Mr. Valentino the occasional dresses and becoming more of a lifestyle brand and so that was perfect for me because I really um, um, understood 
the mission and the vision. And so, you know, for me, it was like, all right, how do we execute this vision and get it out to stores? And we were able to do that. And I primarily took on a role of opening up shopping shops. Mm. And so in about two years, I opened up 42 shopping shops. And I mean, I was busy. I was, I was like a real estate agent in every Neiman's, Saks, Nordstrom's. I wanted to make sure that we have a presence to drive our business. Wow. And so I was really busy in doing that. And that really helped me um, kind of solidify with our senior management that um, I knew how to grow a business, grow a business, and and really um, take on a, you know a completely new challenge. And so from there, I had um, I was given a role of of opening up stores in South America. So I had a whole new role. So I was actually um, head of business development for South America for Valentino. Took on opening up stores in Paraguay, um, uh, Panama. Uh, all over South America, which wow. is you know a whole other story because it's very different in terms of how business is done down there. Right. And so um, you know took on that challenge, and then at the same time, <clears throat> uh, the parent company of Valentino bought Balmain, and so um, initially I was just asked to help and help them kind of figure out the U.S. And so I started off doing that. And ultimately, within, I don't know, three or four months, I was appointed the um, president managing director of the Americas, both North and South America. And so quickly got to work there. And I had this kind of weird role are we because I was... Go, are we just going to slide past that title, though? That's oh. major, Sean. Yeah. That's amazing. Say that title again. It, <laughs> Let's do that again. Let's say that again. You were appointed to what now? President and managing director of the Americas. For? For Main. Major. We're not yeah. just gonna slide past that. We're not. We're, I mean, I guess we're not now. <laughs> right. You know, but you know, I think at the time it was. You know, it's funny because you know, at the time in which I came up in the industry, you know, you pretty much were. It was ingrained to keep your head down and just keep working, and so celebrating those little moments where it wasn't something it's that. It is now the time is separated from the moment. You know, you you understand how big it was, but for me, it was like, all right, I'm here. I got to make sure right. that we get the job done and, and right. we just keep moving. So, you know, I think even now, so I have to like catch myself in celebrating that, right? Yeah. And because um, it is, it was a very big role, and the fact that they trusted me with that role said, you know, spoke huge. volumes. It was huge. And so, but I was, um, I came at a time when the brand really didn't have a presence here. We only had one store in the U.S. And so I had opened up the LA store. I had uh, signed a deal to open up um, Miami, Las Vegas. And then uh, um, in Brazil as well, in, in Sao Paulo. So it was it was a pretty, um, it was a very interesting role because I was busy. Like when I mean, I was in, if I wasn't in Paris, I was traveling somewhere. I was like 90% travel, Wow. you know? So I was, I was rarely home. Um, and I think even my wife at the time was just like, are you going to come visit us right. at, at any point? Right. And so, um, no, but it was, it was, um, I learned so much being in that role. It was, it was probably um, for me, um, a moment in life where I was confident in what I was doing right. and I was being a learning leader, right? Yeah. And so that was really important for me because I was, um, I understood the business, but now I'm managing people, I'm managing situations. And that was, um, and what I didn't know at the time was that it was preparing me for something so much greater. Right, right. right. And so. Because um, that's how it works, right? That is how it works. We never know what we're being prepared for. That is exactly it. And so I was like, man, I got to do this. I got to be here. I got to do that. And it's like, it was just preparing me for the next step. I love that. Yeah. Um, when you think about where you were, you were very successful in a career. <clears throat> it is one of the, I think, hardest things you can decide to do is to start a fashion label yeah. and a fashion brand. Um, so there must have been something that was bigger than you calling yeah. you to this. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. One of the things that I've heard recently and it really struck a nerve with me is that, you know, especially in the U.S., one of the things that um, the number one addiction in the U.S. is not alcohol. It's not drugs. It's not. It's a paycheck. Mm. It's a paycheck. People are addicted to a paycheck. Wow. And so when it comes to thinking outside the box, you don't want to do that because you're addicted to it. Hey, I got to make this. I got to do that. And I fell victim to that too, right? right? We were all, you know, and so being an entrepreneur, you're betting on yourself. Yes. And so, you know, um, during the time in which I had to start to start my own, it was, um, it was during the pandemic. And I'm sitting around, and I'm thinking, 
what is next? What's next? I'm on the other side of 40. What's next? Do I want to continue down this path? I can go and get another job. Right. Or do you want to take a chance and do something different and something that you really believe in? And if so, what is it going to take and what does it look like? And so I sat in the basement and just business plan after business plan, idea after idea. My wall in the basement looked like an episode of Homeland. I had like drawings from one side <laughs> wow. to the next. It was, it was, um, but it was my mind just kind of like re resetting in a way right. um, and unleashing all this creativity that was there. And it's funny because even with the creativity, there's still like a rationality because I'm asking myself, why does this need to exist? Mm. Right. And so I, in building June 79, I was putting the kill test to it like every week. Why do I need to do this? Why does it need to exist? Is there something else like it? And then the more you start to dig into it, you realize there is nothing else like this. Mm. All right. Because, you know, it's funny being on the corporate side. I mean, I remember my mom was like, hey, your friend has a fashion line or your cousin has it. Why don't you go help them out? And it's like, all right, everyone's got a line. All right. And so you're kind of, um, you're, you come from that mindset to now I have a line, right? I got a collection. I have an idea. And so those, um, the first six months were, were really hard, you know, in terms of coming up with the idea. And then um, there's a quote that I heard too that always cracks me up. It said, if you want to know who your friends are, tell them your plans. Wow. Right. And so, you I've know. I've never heard that quote, but that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. And so you tell them your plans and you have some people who will, hey, that's great. How can I help? And others like, man, who do you think you are? Right. You know, and so I got both sides of it. And really, it, it allowed me to focus even more and dig deeper into what I was doing because I really believed in what I was doing with June 79. And really, it stemmed from looking at how the world was shifting. We're in the, we're, during the pandemic, you know, the world was shifting. You know, everyone was home, but people still had to work. Um, the environment in which we were in was, a, it was a seismic shift, Yeah. you know? And so to expect people to go back to work the way they were before, I thought was would be a little short-sighted and that the world would not necessarily completely change, but just shift in the axis, right? right? And so um, another quote is not a quote, but you know they always say the earth is on a tilt, right? And so if it was to shift just even one degrees, our complete weather patterns would change. And so that's kind of what the pandemic did, right? right. Everything shifted and it just felt different and we moved different. And so, um, then it was more, if we're dressing up for work, how can we, and moving from this casual environment of the pandemic right. into back a business setting, whatever that looks like in a post-pandemic world, you know, how do we account for the shift? So that's where, you know, June 79 really started to take shape and, and take life. And I know that your brother yeah. was a part of your inspiration. It was. You and still is. a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, junior. So June in the June 79 is, is junior. So my brother who when I was on the corporate side of things, um, really was pushing me to do my own thing. So why don't you start your own brand? Why don't you start your own brand? And I was, I didn't want to blow up my life to start something new. And he was like, man, you could be the next FUBU. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be the next FUBU. And so, you know, but his thing was, I see what you're doing and you can do it for yourself. And so, um, you know, unfortunately he had passed away mm -hmm. and that, um, during that time it was, it was, it was heavy on me, but as time started to separate from the moment, I think, you know, I kept drowning out that voice. And then when you're sitting alone, when you finally have a moment, which the pandemic created to like, think about everything, it was his voice. Like, yo, now's the time. Just go ahead and do it. Just do it. You know what I mean? And, and so it's always like, you know, but what if you fail? It's like, no, but what if you fly, you know? And so um that and so when june you know i was also born in june of seven so it plays on so many things but right. it was it was that it was it was june junior but june and june 79 that really to me is like what keeps me moving forward every day i get up and it's like all right i know it's gonna be a tough day even you know good yeah. or bad it still pushes through so I yeah love that. and there are <clears throat> you know <clears throat> there are some days during entrepreneurship where you're just like, what do oh. I have that's oh. going to push me through this day, <laughs> right? You're like, I mean, where am I going to get this strength, energy, inspiration? Because you not only have to inspire yourself, you have to inspire a team. Absolutely. 
I mean, there have been days I fired myself at like 9.30, <laughs> rehired myself by 12 o'clock, like, all right, we got things to do. Let's get back to work. And so it is. It's a roller coaster of emotions because you're grasping onto every moment because you're so invested in it, right? And so, you know, it's it's like any company. And, and when you build it from the ground on, you know how it is. It's like your own child. It's like your own family. And so you grasp onto every moment. And, yeah. and then that just causes these emotional roller coasters that you have to navigate um, with, you know, a sense of, um, you know, uh, mental fortitude. Yeah. Because yeah. it is, it is, there are some days when it's really, really tough. Yeah. It really is. Absolutely. Um, and you have to look at, you know, what you've accomplished and like actually celebrate it. Yeah. Because we just roll right past those accomplishments. So let's talk about some of the places where June 79 is sold. Yeah. So we're sold in Saks, um, which I'm really excited about because I was I was there. And so that's I a, think that's a full circle moment. <clears throat> that is a very full circle moment. But it's how it happened. You know, I think for me, um, you know, during the time when I launched in 21, and it was a time where a lot of stores were looking for people of color to bring in their brand, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, one store not to be named was, a, you know, wanted to bring us in. It's like, we want to put you in a black area. I'm like, well, that's what else? You know, mm -hmm. because our product, we're a high touch, high feel product. How do you envision, like, who's your customer? So I'm asking all the business questions. Right, right. And they couldn't necessarily answer that. It was like, we have an area. We just want to put that in there. And that didn't make sense. And so in talking to the team at Saks and, you know, shout out to Louis DiGiacomo and, and Charmaine um, Harrison, who came in and said, look, we identify a customer that we think that June 79 fits. Like that guy who doesn't want to wear a suit to work, um, wants to still be professional, but still wants a sense of style, checks off all these boxes. And we think there's an opportunity. And this is where we're going to put you. We see you sitting in between our, our clothing department and our designer department. Mm. And I was like, you guys get it. Let's go. And so we, um, and then they rolled us out to seven doors and we've had this tremendous success there. Um, our business there has been thriving. And I think we just feel a void that no one um, has, has yet. We're defining a very undefined space in fashion, you know, yeah. I think, which is one of the hardest things to do is how do you create something that doesn't exist? Right. So while it takes time to build, I think what what has really struck a nerve is that people can see how it fits into their world. Right. And that's been the success. So being at Saks has been great. They're a great partner. Um, the conversations are great. They understand it. Um, I was also in the New Wave program. So they identify uh, brands, emerging brands who have had success with them that they want to highlight and continue to talk about. And yep. so that has been um a great moment to um, to continue to connect the product and me to their consumers. What drives you? Hmm, everything. Everything. I'm driven by everything. I'm driven by my family. I'm driven by um, the younger version of me who didn't understand what this world now is. I um, I'm driven by my colleagues, uh, peers, people who, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, you always hear go where you're celebrated. And there are people who just randomly just shout you out and just be like, y'all know what you're going through, but keep going. Like, that's all I needed. And so, um, you know, from and I'm also self-motivated. You know, I'm really self-motivated and hungry to um, put this out in the world. I feel like, you know, there, there are so few moments that you get to introduce something to the world. And here I am, the kid from Brooklyn, having the opportunity to do that. So I am, that is... That pushes me every day. I, yeah. What it, What was your family's reception when they <clears> saw <throat> June seventy nine as like a real brand? Uh, ecstatic. You know, my my son was really excited. He was like, "This is really cool." But the one that got me was my daughter. My daughter, when she saw that, was she was just like, "My dad <laughs> is a designer," <laughs> and so. <clears throat> Her excitement, her joy, you know, is something that has always, always, always touched me. And then my wife also, her support, you know, and even on a day, because she also hears the complaints too. I'm like, well, this didn't happen, and that didn't happen, I need this to happen. And she's, you know, been such a driving force in in my um, in my drive, you know. And so that, you know, seeing her reaction, our first show, 
during um, your show, um, during the, um, the, um, the Style Awards in Harlem on the street, which was just an amazing setting, amazing backdrop. And so, you know, after the show, the look on her face wow. um, really made me feel special. You know, of all of that happened, it was a look on her face. So, you know, my family has been, they're very important to me. And, and um, you know, on at every moment they keep me sane. Just a thought on them brings me back down to reality. And so their reaction, their excitement, their enthusiasm for June 79. I mean, they're asking for stuff to wear now <laughs> to school, um, which always makes me feel good. Right. You know, and so. You got to make um, June 79 kids so. I do, I do, because the request, and not just them, their friends too. Right, right. So if their friends are asking, "Hey, can I get a June '79 jacket?" Right. I'm like, "Talk to your mom and dad," like, <laughs> you right, know. Right. But I'm happy to make one for you, and so, but to see that this this next generation are excited um, by it is 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 really fun too. It's fun. It's fun. You should put up a June '79 store on Roblox. That's a good idea. Right? I love that. Right? Yeah. My daughter is always on Roblox and she's like, Mom, Harlem's <clears throat> Fashion Row need to be on Roblox. It's brilliant. And I'm like, you're right. Can you go build that for right? me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> can you go build that? She probably can. Um, it's it's uh, it's funny. The whole gaming and, and, and the virtual world, there are so many opportunities there. And I think the, um, the kids see it. Yeah, they know it. Yeah. My son games. He does everything. Two K. He's like June seventy nine should be on two K. Yeah, because they have to buy outfits. You right, know, you right. and you unlock these things, and so. But they're absolutely right because it's it's such a big part of their world. Right. You know, they, and, they, know. they, they know. know. What was that moment for you? Like the <clears throat> moment where Lil Sean couldn't even believe that this was happening. Somebody who was in June seventy nine, that you know maybe something that you had dreamt of. Yeah, uh, Steph Curry, mm. my son seeing, because that's his favorite player, and mm -hmm. he plays basketball. He's really into, like, he's in this basketball world that is, like, consume even my weekends. And mm -hmm. so I bought into his dreams as well, is him buying into mine. And so um, uh, shout out to um, Sherry. Sherry McMullen. Uh, Sherry McMullen, who From made McMullen this happen. Boutique. Oh, absolutely. She made this happen. And so she reached out and said, we have an opportunity. We're dressing um, Steph Curry throughout the playoffs, and we want – you know, designers of color and so um we sent over a couple of looks and he wanted every last one of them and so that was pretty incredible now mind you i'm still thinking all right maybe maybe right, not right. and so and it just so happens he wears it he tags us and you know people are he actually tagged you guys yeah because a did. lot of times celebs are weird but they won't tag. they won't tag i know he was the first one to tag a lot wow. of people that wore and we had people wear our product before but they wouldn't tag right because right, our right. product is a little bit more indescript there's no logos right, right you know we don't we focus more on allowing people to uh, show the best version of themselves right right and so but that tag is important it is. It so lets if somebody's people watching this, tag is important. <laughs> tag the brand. Tag the brand, especially a designer of color. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And it's it's something that we've, there's been a lot of conversation about it in our industry. And so, um, but him wearing it and then my son seeing it and he's like, dad, is this yours? I'm like, yeah, it is. And he's like, you got Steph Curry oh wearing your product. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. So he's, you know, he's going nuts. He's going crazy. And um, it was exciting. And then, you know, for him, I think it he knew it was real, but it became even more real right, right. at that moment. And so um, uh, that was probably the biggest moment. Who is him. the dream? Who is the one who has not worn June 79 yet that you want to get it on? Ooh, I have two. Okay. I have two. Um, Barack. Yes. I want to see Barack. And just a clean, I mean, this is his vibe, though. This is his vibe. I just want to see him in a clean... Pierre Blazer, just, Somebody you know. is, Somebody's going to watch this. They're going to know the stylist for President Barack Obama. Let's hope. And you're going to hit up June 79. Right. We Let's go. That. Let's go. Hey, 44, I'm here. I'm here. I can dress you. <laughs> Let me know. And so, yeah, he's one. And then being I'm from Brooklyn, I, you know, I have a, a, a huge admiration and respect for Sean Carter, Jay-Z. So... And I think our clothing is his vibe as well. And so it I would, absolutely is. It is. I think, you know, he's elevated himself into a point, you know, from where he started to where he is now is super commendable. And so I'd love to see him. I already got like looks set up for him. So the wow. day I get the call, right. it's already it's already set up. So um at least mentally here. So it's just a matter of that happening. And I would take the lunch over to five hundred thousand. So 
That's just, <laughs> even though I could use the 500,000, I'm still taking the lunch, see, which see, has been an argument for see, <laughs> Let me tell you, I said, I'm going to take the 500,000. No disrespect to Jay-Z. No disrespect. Well, I'm going to take the 500,000. I'm going to build something great. And then I'm going to go and tell Jay-Z, hey, look, I had this opportunity and this is the one I chose. And now we still sitting at the table together. This is true. This is true. <laughs> But I think that within that 30, whatever, the hour and a half, yeah. I got I got 15 minutes. We're going to talk about music. Right. And the rest, I'm like, hey, I got about 15 ideas. Right. And I'd love for you to be part of at least 10 of them. I love that. <laughs> I love it. Love it. And so, um, but yeah, those are the two that, you know, I would really like to see in the product. And then, you know, I think um, from there, it just, you know, the product will continue to grow and evolve and, and you know, within our consumer base and younger and older. I think both of those are going to happen within the next year. I think they're both going to happen within the next year. I would love to see that, yeah, you know, and, and I'm happen. ready for the moment. You absolutely. know, for me, it's, it's about being ready for the moment. And, and, um, and you're ready. Yeah. And, you're ready. and the brand is ready. The brand is ready. The brand is absolutely ready. So I want to end on kind of, you know, there are so many people who want to pursue their dreams. Mm -hmm who want to pursue entrepreneurship endeavors, who have things that, you know, maybe they're working in corporate right now, but they're like, I've got this other thing that's like burning in me yeah. and I need to get it out. What advice do you have? Yeah, for those who want to pursue, uh, you know, anything entrepreneurial, any passion, um, I would say my advice is if you love it, it won't feel like work. Mm. Right. And so if you have a job, do it while you have a job, you know, let that be your side project. And, you know, there's this old quote that a man becomes a man or woman becomes rich or poor by what they do outside of work. Mm. Right. And so if you sell T-shirts, you know, on the side, you never know what that turns into. Um, and so I think that for those who are passionate about whatever it is, culinary arts, if you're passionate about cooking, cook for people on the side, invite yeah. people over, have dinner parties, right? Um, if you're, whatever you're passionate about, um, do it while you work. And eventually you'll find that that will overtake your work until you don't have to work like that anymore in terms of a job. Now you focus on a career and a passion. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and then have patience with it. But mostly be patient with yourself. Yes. I think, you know, being patient with yourself is super important. I have moments where I'm very impatient with myself um, and I have to catch myself. And, you know, I think that uh, fatherhood has taught me patience. Yep. You know, as I'm sure motherhood has taught you patience as <laughs> yeah. well, right? So it teaches yeah. you how to be patient on another level. And so that's really helped. But um, it's really key to be patient, build out your plan. It's the old mantra if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yep. So just put your plan together. And then, you know, go out and execute. I love that. You know what I'm saying? A June 79 book that is Sean's favorite quotes. Because you got uh, a lot of quotes. I do. You got a lot of quotes. So I, I'm a big quote guy. I, it's the one thing I always memorize. So yeah. I always, um, even when I was, so during my tenure at Saks, uh, the 10 years that I was there, I would always pull my team in. We had these meetings and I would always do the quote of the week. So every week for 10 years, I had a quote of the week. And for those who remember the, what we used to call the SB school at the Hard Knocks. And so I always had a quote of the week and it's something that I still to this day, because they kind of help you put things in perspective, right? It's not a long diatribe. It's, it's, it's a sentence that can help yeah. you understand um, and or focus when you need to. I love it. What's your favorite quote? What's oh. one of those quotes that get you through? Uh, Maya Angelou. No one remembers what you said. No one remembers what you did, but everyone remembers how you made them feel. I love that. And that is something that no matter what's happening, how you feel in that moment, it's something that um, can carry you through in so many different ways. Yeah. Perfect. That's yeah. a wrap. Thank yeah. you so much, Thank Sean. Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. Um, for being on this episode of the Fashion and Color show. It was so good having you. Same here. And I got something you. for you too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> this a gift? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank and you. And I wrote in it. Uh -huh. So you could... You could I can open it? it? Yeah, you can go ahead and take a look at it. I got a gift for you too. It's, it's outside, but I'll get it. Yeah, so I'm excited to see where you're going. You know, I always felt like... Thank you. June 79 is going to be a huge brand. You said you were one of the first that said it's that. It's going to be a you huge brand. You were one of the first that said that. Absolutely. And, and I... 
you know, your words have stuck true to that in terms of like your brand is going to be a legacy brand and you are one of the first. Thank you for this, by the way. Thank You're you. You're welcome. And thank you for the unwavering support. You've, Absolutely. you've been there and I um, beyond appreciate you that, you know, words won't even. I'm excited. Yeah. For you. Thank I'm you. excited for the brand and where you're going. Just, just Thank remember you. the little people on your way up. Oh, come on! I'm, <laughs> hey, we all. If, if I go there, we all there. We I all love there. I, I love, love that. It. Thank you. Thank you. All right.